Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Airmen from the planet Earth, first step foot upon the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Let's go to the moon. 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 Welcome to a very special event here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It's so neat to have guests who are so jazzed about what we do as much as we're jazzed about what you do. I, I'd like to introduce our guest to you right now, Lori McCreary. She's the CEO of Revelations Entertainment. Now, this is the production company that does Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. And it is that guy right there. They're wrapping up their fifth season on Science Channel. And then, of course, I have to introduce Morgan Freeman, the Academy Award winning actor, and also host of Through the Wormhole. And then James Younger, another executive producer for the show, and here to talk to us today. So let's put all of this into context about why we're here. So let's go back 45 years ago to July 20th, 1969. Now that is the day that not NASA's Apollo 11 crew landed on the moon and the world watched as astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set their lunar module Eagle down in the sea of tranquility. And that's while crewmate Mike Collins orbited above in the command module. Now, 45 years ago, remember, and that was when Armstrong said those famous words, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So today we're taking this opportunity to look back at that giant leap and also to look forward, to look ahead at the next giant leap, doing things like sending astronauts to Mars. So let's get this conversation started. First of all, I mean, Morgan, do you remember that day? Do you know where you were and what it was, I was like? Yes, I was, I, was, I, I was in my apartment in uh, New York, um, lying on the couch watching this. I cried. You did? Yeah. Oh. yeah. And I wanted to ask how many people, are any, anybody here old enough to have seen that? <laughs> Maybe a handful. Uh, you know, that tells you that looking at something like that, and it, we just landed on the moon. We learned one thing there that was very, very, I think, instructive to a lot of us. Not made of green cheese. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> such a momentous event to, to have actually done that and come back. Mm -hmm. uh, proof positive that whatever we can imagine, we can do. Backed. James, where, do you remember it or are you too young? <laughs> I was uh, probably seeing it between my building blocks that I was uh, assembling <laughs> on my floor. I don't have any great memories of it. <laughs> uh, I don't either. I don't have any memories of it. I've only yeah. heard through people. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I do remember uh, watching uh, tape of Kennedy and his admonition that we could do this. And I think that that's the great thing, is that if, mm -hmm. if there's enough leadership and enough excitement and enough vision, we can pretty much accomplish anything. Well, Maureen, I mean, you know, you're here with an audience full, a lot of, of, of students and student interns who are just so excited to see you. I mean, tell me a little bit about you. Uh, were you always into science yourself? Were you excited about science growing up? No. No. <laughs> were you good at science? No. <laughs> um, I'm, I, listen, truth, I'm an actor been an actor all my life. Um, my uh, involvement here is, to me, one of the mysteries 
of my life because it's only through uh, show business that I wind up uh, having this, this relationship with the JPL, the JPL? Yeah, it's the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, so yeah. Um, I am like most people, uh, I like science fiction and any science that attaches itself to my science fiction reading and seeing, uh, then I'm excited because, oh, it's not just a, an, an imagination anymore, it's for real. Uh, I remember when I read Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the atomic submarine that he had invented. Well, what is less, it's about 100 years, 150 years later, we have an atomic submarine. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a mantra. If we can imagine it, we can do it. It's, it's, he falls into the category of prophetic science fiction writer. Mm -hmm. uh, Arthur C. Clarke, yes. it's another one. So uh, my interest in science is not an interest in science per se. I'm not a scientist, I'm not scientific minded. I'm right brained, I don't do math. <laughs> so. that, if I could just um, sure. challenge Morgan. More, the, the reason that we are, <laughs> we've worked together for 20 years so I can do that. Um, the, the reason that we're doing something like Through the Wormhole is because Morgan is interested and perhaps he doesn't have the scientific background to go in and finalize equations for people, but he asks questions. And the one story I love that you tell is when he was in high school, he was, uh, had a physics, was it a physics class? Physics class. And, um, and perhaps on the tests, he wasn't making great grades, but he got a very high grade because he asked questions and he was engaged. And that's the thing that he does for us. When we're working on wormhole and we have, we're looking at scripts, he asks questions from a different perspective than perhaps someone who had scientific training. So it gives us a, a, a unique perspective, I think, when we're presenting science. Like the dumbest person in the room <laughs> asking the question. Not true. But there are no dumb questions. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. see? But, but, you know, I think that's the whole basis of exploration, right, is to be curious and to ask questions and want to know how that works. So is that pretty much what you do? Is that your approach? Just asking a question. We do ask questions. We, we, you know, we think, well, you know, we, let's look at the universe. We had a question, well, is there an edge to the universe? Something that a lot of scientists trained in cosmology wouldn't ask, like, well, it's three-dimensional curved space. It's not really an edge, blah, 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 blah. And we're like, well, no, hang on a minute. Let's try and understand that. What would a normal person think? Well, there's a ball, and somehow there's some inside and outside. Um, so we approach it from that angle, and when you, when you talk to scientists and engage them uh, in that way, it's very illuminating, and, and, you know, and it, it really allows us to explain very complicated science that's really beyond, you know, beyond any high school student. We get into it, and uh, the, you know, people are illuminated and informed and feel like they know more about the universe. Well, speaking of which, we have an, a copy of a clip from Wormhole, uh, and if yeah. you want to set it up and kind yeah. of explain it to us, we'll roll it. Well, one of the things we, uh, on, on Through the Wormhole we do, as well as explaining science, is we try and under, let people understand what it's like to be a scientist. I mean, with NASA, of course, you have these glamorous lives with the astronauts who go where no one's gone before, and maybe you think working in space science research is also going to be that exciting, and, uh, well, here's the truth about it. <laughs> 26,000 light years away, there's a place where we could learn the true nature of gravity. It's the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Astronomers think this hole in space is not much bigger than our sun. Seeing something that size so far away would take a telescope the size of our planet. So, why not build one? Astronomer Shep Dolman's career was launched when he answered the call to adventure and landed here. What excited me about this particular brand of radio astronomy was that you got to travel the world 
I said, well, that's for me. I definitely want to go out into the field and do that. And then when I got here, they said, well, largely that work's been done. Shep does most of his work trapped in his office, where he often escapes by daydreaming about being the first astronomer to observe a black hole. It's one of the hardest problems in his field because astronomers can only observe objects that radiate light. When you ask yourself what a black hole looks like, you, you really have to begin with, why do we see black holes at all? By definition, they should be invisible. When light enters a black hole, it's gone forever. But not all of the light around a black hole gets sucked in. Some of it bends around the event horizon, creating a shadow image of the black hole. That image could reveal how gravity behaves at the event horizon. But by the time the light reaches us, the signal is so diluted that Shep would need a telescope thousands of miles across to pick it up. So, he set out to build one. Shep is traveling to exotic locations around the world, coordinating a massive international collaboration. In the spring of 2015, nearly all of the world's high-precision telescopes will point towards the center of our galaxy. So at the center of our galaxy is an extraordinary object. It's a supermassive black hole. And because it is so massive, and because it's relatively close to us, we have a shot, we have a chance to resolve it. That's great. How many people relate to this guy? <laughs> you are with your family here. I have a question. We have three, four different types of galaxies. We have the spiral galaxy, we have the uh, sprocket galaxy, and the one that has armed over pinwheel, here and arms over here yeah. and pinwheel galaxy. Mm -hmm. Ellipticals. Uh, does every galaxy create a black hole in its creation? Um, well, you're asking the wrong guy. There's some people in here could answer it, but well, yes. That's just a question. Anybody Who here? knows? Anybody got any ideas? Yeah, every galaxy has a supermassive black hole yeah. at the center. Huh? Yeah, every, every, every galaxy. Supermassive Seems like black hole. hole. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How do you know that? How do you, how do you know that? <laughs> how do you know? So this is obviously a really, really complicated subject. Very complicated. How did you make it so relatable for everybody? They get me to talk about it. <laughs> That's no, true. No, no. We, you know, we find the scientists, we talk to them, we try, as you can see, we try and understand what their life is like, and we try and get into their character, and through telling someone's story, you are able to understand what they're working on better. So it, it's, you know, we, we, there's complicated science, very simply stated, and uh, someone's character that you get engaged with, and you want him to get out of his office and go and you know, assemble this radio telescope uh, virtual uh, array. And, um, and so you, you're, you're dragged along in the story, and you, you understand the science along the way. It doesn't seem like a lecture. Like, okay, here's how a black hole works, here's the equation, here's the escape velocity. We just tell it through someone's story. I think for us, too, we're, if we didn't make Wormhole, if we didn't produce through the Wormhole, we would be fans of the show. So we're our own worst critics when it comes to, does that really make sense? Is it interesting? And because we come from film and storytelling backgrounds, we're always looking for ways to engage whoever's sitting in the audience watching it. And then it's hard to beat Morgan's voice on top of it. Oh. And, and, and our director and writer is just like, well, James, because he's so modest, is what's your PhD in? Biophysics. Okay, so soft science. He, he's, he's, he, he, he knows a lot about physics and science, and he um, and he can talk one-on-one -on -one with all of our scientists. And he's a genius writer. And so, if it's understandable, it's because he's writing the words. Right. Morgan, you have a long history of of you know relating to young people. The Electric Company. Um, is that something that you've always kind of made a priority to reach out to younger? Don't particularly like young people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, They're annoying. <laughs> no, I don't mean people as young as you. But uh, so I kind of sometimes feel a little bit like W. C. Fields in that. Uh, 
the only thing that I seem to have going for me in terms of young people is that I don't meet them as young people. I meet them as people and, and they respond to that. So I get kind of a good pat on the back just for their reaction to me. I'm absolutely, you know, okay, go away, kid, you bother me. You know? <laughs> but you co-created this company and with an objective to bring more of this material out there. Do you think that in Hollywood, there's just a reluctance to do more stuff like this because people wouldn't appreciate it? Or? No, I, I, personally, I don't think so. I don't think Hollywood's reluctant to do anything unless it, they know it's not gonna make any money. <laughs> but if they can see a dollar, see, the whole point, it's not just that we're money hungry, but it takes money to make them. So if you don't make money making them, you can't make them. That makes sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But reality shows have always been considered the, the cheaper show. You know, you just you know, follow people around. But you've sort of taken reality and kind of taken it up a notch. We, we like to call it factual. Sure. Instead of reality, we, the audience, you know, we, we, I think the audience appreciates not being talked down to. They, you know, the audience is capable of far more than most television shows give them credit for. And when they when you're, people, you engage the audience on a high level, people respond and they like it. Well, there was one piece, one segment that talked about the ocean as a conscious living being. That was a completely new concept. Why approach something like that? Why did you want to, to see us to relate to the ocean as like another person? Well, because there are scientists who are looking at it in just in those terms, and they inform us. Uh, how many times has the, has the ocean risen up and wiped out everything? Five times. Five times. Yeah. Five times has the ocean completely eliminated life on the planet, except in, maybe not in, except in the ocean. Right, most of the life on the on planet has been wiped out, yeah. Wiped out. How does the ocean do that? It creates a virus. And we know what viruses can do. I think the ocean is sentient. Uh, it's, there is entirely too much going on in there for it not to be. Uh, now consider this for a minute and a half. <laughs> what if the ocean really is aware of itself? Then it's aware of what we are doing to it. If it's aware of what we are doing to it, how is it going to respond? <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't buy that you don't like science. <laughs> I'm sorry, because... That is not science. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> I don't buy it. That's <laughs> fear. <laughs> you know, because it's clear you learned, and it is clear you're really interested. Well, help, and help us if we don't learn, and if we're not interested. I, you know, I'm trying to keep up so at... Uh, when the uh, ca ca uh, Armageddon, what do you call it? When the cataclysm comes, I've got a deep enough hole, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if there were one big goal that you would like to fulfill in terms of teaching people something, what would it be? We have a telescope in space called the Kepler. Kepler, Kepler yeah. Kepler. We are looking for other signs of life in the universe. We have discovered hundreds of star systems with planets. We have discovered no sign of anything that even might support life. This is the only planet we got, and we're not taking good care of it. If I was going to give anybody any advice, I would say, think better about what we're doing to the home. 
So what would you like, what would you be interested in in pursuing on Earth then, exploring on Earth? I'm going to get into trouble here. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of which, we've got people about 250 miles above us right now who are egging to talk to you, and they're right there. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Let me introduce, <laughs> let me introduce astronaut Reese Wiseman, and he's the person on the left, and also Commander Steve Swanson. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you guys standing up? <laughs> it's our pleasure to be here. So there's a, a few seconds. <laughs> There's a few seconds of delay, but I'm going to let Morgan and company take it away and let them ask you questions. <laughs> All right. OK, so you guys are out there floating around, tossing that microphone back and forth very cleverly. <laughs> We're all curious, of course, show off. <laughs> All right, uh, one of my bucket list things is going to be to get up there with you so I can just try that. <laughs> what do you think it's going to take to get us to Mars? You know what I'm saying? How does the International Space Station help us answer the question, how do we get to Mars? That's a really good question. I mean, there's definitely a few ways of looking at that. One, of course, is we need the technology. We need the ability to have life support that lasts for many years, not many years, but three or four years possibly. It's robust. It has all the parts on board that can make it there. We need protection from when we're outside the Earth's uh, Van, Van Helen belts, uh, all sorts of things. But the big thing with this gives us, it gives us a place to try all these things out. We can see what works and what doesn't work on this, on this vehicle. Thank you very much. Um, what do you think about the idea of, this was mine some months ago, building the uh, vehicle that will go to Mars in space rather than on Earth? Well, obviously, since this was your idea, it was a, a very, very good, I'd almost say a perfect idea. Uh, certainly, if we could build a heavy lift vehicle that could launch up a lot of parts and a, a lot of mass and then assemble this in low Earth orbit outside of our atmosphere, uh, I think that would be a, a great way to start. And really, uh, if you just looked at the space station as kind of a modular design, if we just started with a, a HAB module and, uh, and maybe a laboratory, then that's a great start. And we kind of already have that with the space station. So if you just took a few parts off of this, put some motors on it, and started on your way, that's I think that's kind of the basic building block of what we'll need to get to Mars. And about how much time would you imagine that would take? <laughs> that is a good question. Of course, unfortunately, it always depends on how much money you have. And uh, again, though, I think we have the technology for that to build the components uh, capable of doing that. We just have to get the idea, desire, and put the resources to it and get it done. Period. Right. Now, uh, I think we're spending a lot of money doing the wrong things, but we could do different things. But, uh, where's your circadian rhythm headset? <laughs> well, we work based on uh, London time, really, and we, we, we have a, a, a standard Earth 24-hour day, and we spend uh, about 10 hours of that at work doing some exercise and, uh, and then all the science that we're doing up here. And then we're sleeping really on average about seven to eight hours a night. So even though we see 16 sunrises and sunsets a day, our bodies are fairly well adjusted to, to space flight and it's a fairly Earth-based schedule for us. What does the instrument actually do? Does it tell you when to go to sleep or what time it is or, do, or is it just monitoring you? 
Oh, for the circadian rhythm science experiment that we're working right now. So we wear, uh, it's a, a heat flux sensor on our forehead and on our sternum, and it's just measuring really our core body temperature over 24 hours. And it's looking at what happens to you when you're in a weightless environment with no natural light, really. And uh, what is your body doing? Does it does it understand this, this complex system that you're living in or not? And so far, it looks like, with a few exceptions, it really does kind of understand and it falls into this routine pretty well. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Okay. Lori, you have a question? Oh, yeah. Oh, we, I, I, we have a question too. Oh, how much we have more time, right? Yes. Well, I want to ask about a trip to Mars. I, I understand it's probably going to be about a three year trip. Um, Are you going? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, from what I've been told, it's about nine months there, given the current technology we have. And to make everything line up again for when you come back, you've got to send about a year and a half on Mars. So it's lined up so when you leave Mars, you'll back, end up uh, in the orbit of Earth again. So that t adds up to about a uh, three-year three trip, sorry. And, been inside and to answer the question of would we go... Uh, I would say absolutely we would go. And uh, I sent my wife an email just kind of discussing this with her, and she said, we'll talk when I get home. <laughs> right. So go ahead, James. Well, so how do you feel about being locked together in a room for three years? How do you think that's going to work out? Well, that's another, you have to be uh, good friends. Luckily, I think we'd be able to make it. Uh, <laughs> of course, we already come up with ways to uh, handle uh, if we have disputes. We already have a, a set up for dueling up here. So that's the way we handle our disputes up here. But uh, overall, I think if you get the right compatibility uh, and you have the right things to do and you have the right goal, you can get it done. Great. We wanted to wish you happy Mandela Day from Earth here. This is Madiba's birthday. So we're going to, and also, you know, he asked for everybody to give six or seven minutes to um, aid to uh, the fellow man. We won't ask you to do it because I think you're already doing it. So. any more we questions? Were, we were learning about the uh, water and air recycle systems that would have to take place with, um, on a trip to Mars. How is the International Space Station, um, are you working on those systems and how are they working for you guys up there? So we have, we have some absolutely fantastic systems up here right now. I think the one we're really the most proud of is uh, the water reclamation system. So every drop of sweat, any condensation, even our urine gets pulled into a system, recycled and turned into drinking water. And we're running, I think, about over 90% of water reclamation up here. And so that's a huge one because water is unbelievably heavy. Uh, just go carry around a bucket of water and you would see that launching a bunch of water into space is going to be pretty difficult up mass. And then for uh, for atmosphere system, we're scrubbing CO2 out. We have some other systems that can take water, turn them into oxygen. So really, uh, we're we're very very close to having uh, a perfect system, and uh, and it's pretty reliable. We have a little bit further to go on reliability, but we're almost there. Reed, what are some of the other experiments you're working on on the space station? I mean, paving the way to us one day being able to travel to Mars. Yeah. Right now, I've been working on upgrading our Robonaut, which is a, uh, a robotic astronaut for us up here. And hopefully one day, it will be able to do tasks and help us out explore new places like Mars. And if we had to go outside into a harsh environment, we'd send it out first to maybe fix something or to see what it's like out there to make sure it's safe for us. So I think it's definitely, when we do explore someplace like Mars, it's going to take a human approach and a robotic approach together to make it work. And after all, we are here at JPL, and we're about to launch RapidScat up to you guys. And so uh, can we talk a little bit about the Earth science that you guys are going to be doing and doing now, in fact? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, most of the earth science that we're doing, just like Rapid Scat, these are going to be, uh, I almost call them like uh, strap-on hardware that looks down at the at the earth and is managed from control centers like JPL uh, across our country and really around the world. And so from our perspective, what we're doing is we're taking a lot of pictures. And for us, that's fun. We really like doing it. Uh, but really, uh, once these pictures get downloaded, they're not just pretty pictures of the earth. We have a whole team at NASA that goes through these pictures and they're looking at dune migration, weather patterns, what's going on in our oceans. So really for earth science and earth observation right now, this is a really robust platform combining the crew and the control centers around the world. And it's uh, turning out to be great, valuable science. To say Reed is a major Twitter guy, oh, and he he got right up there and started snapping pictures from the space station. Sends them down. You see storms from above, and wow. it's really been amazing. Does does that help you feel more connected? Do you is is it better having social media up there than than pre social media times? Than pre social media times. Um. It definitely, it adds something to your day. And for the, for the most part, it's certainly a positive experience. But to me, I think every kid has either dreamed of going into space or has at least had a thought of what is it like to look down on our planet from above. And that's the joy, is we're incredibly lucky, the six of us, to be up here right now on the space station out of 7 billion people on the planet. And it's part of our job is to share this experience and, and to make it as real for the public as possible. And it's great to have Instagram, Twitter, all these types of social media where we have a really easy outlet and people can go on if they like. And if they don't want, they don't have to look. And uh, it's been an extremely positive experience for me. Any more questions? One more question okay. I hear. Um, I was hearing about your delivery of a fresh apple this morning that you were quite excited about. What is your, I want to know what, um, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, Newton would be very happy to see that. Um, You've got to stop showing off like that, Reed. Uh, what, here's an important question, and if you, you get tired of all this stuff, then you can just leave. Uh, at your current altitude, are you inside or outside of Earth's, what do you call it, sphere? Uh, the, like the exosphere? The exosphere. Uh, and if you're inside, I can understand that you have uh, pretty good protection. But if you're outside, you have no protection against solar flares. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, from our understanding is we do have protection. We're inside that area, and so we do have protection. And that's one of the big issues of going to Mars when you're outside of that issue, uh, sorry, out that side of that area, that uh, you would get much more radiation. And that's one thing we have to solve before we go on. But we're lucky up here, we only get a slight bit more radiation than on Earth. All right, if we have any more questions, we're, we're about I don't wrapped know up. What they want to eat. What do you guys, when you get back from Mars or you come back from this trip, What's your first meal going to be on Earth? <laughs> yeah, for me, it's been, uh, I've been up here for 50 days. Actually, today is my 51st day. It's been changing a little bit, but right now, uh, I saw somebody eating a pizza on a TV show last night or a couple days ago, and uh, man, that just sparked all the senses. So I'm going to vote pizza right now, Swanee. I'm going for the juicy, juicy hamburger with <laughs> cheese, bacon, the whole thing on it. That's what I want. Well, Reed, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, that's Reed Wiseman and Commander Steve Swanson. I think Steve is going to be leaving a little sooner. I think uh, Reed's going to stay there till November, right? Okay. And we're looking forward to all those tweets. I know you're, you guys are staying busy, but thanks for sharing. Thanks so much, thank guys. You, thank you. Thank you.
so before we move on to questions, I want to talk to a little bit about the look to the future, some of the projects you have ahead, one of which I understand involves one of our projects. Yes, it does. We have a new series coming out on Science Channel, and uh, I believe it premieres on August 13th. Um, it is called Man vs. the Universe, and it's a, series of, uh, a short series of films about uh, the future of space exploration, new projects that NASA is doing, JPL is doing, also in, in incorporating some of the private sector endeavors like SpaceX and other people. Um, and we have one episode, we've shot a couple of things here actually, one of them mm -hmm. on your asteroid capture program, the asteroid redirect mission, which is a proposed mission. And then uh, we worked with uh, your great people, uh, Ian Clark and Mike Meacham mm -hmm. out at the uh, Place is called the snort. Yes. What does the snort stand for again? Oh, it's too difficult to say. It goes, it's, yeah, it's, it's a long slide, yeah. acronym. Oh. Where out they, at China uh, Lake. Testing the parachute that we could use for heavy vehicles oh. on Mars, Probably. including, including right. potentially, you know, human vehicles uh, many years down the line. And that's our LDSD project, and yes. we can just roll the tape and see for ourselves. Yeah. On Earth, the thick atmosphere will slow down a speeding spacecraft to around 200 miles an hour. But Mars's atmosphere is a hundred times thinner. There's only one way to slow down. Use a really big parachute. So we're walking down this really long sled. That's what we need it to be this long to keep all that. The job of JPL engineers Ian Clark and Mike Meacham is to prevent crash landings on Mars. Any manned spacecraft will weigh close to 40 tons. For those kind of loads, they'll need a radically new type of parachute. A year ago, we just landed a one-ton rover on the surface of Mars, the Curiosity rover. And that took all of the technologies that we've developed over the past four decades just to do that. And we've now reached the max of that. The parachute we're testing is designed to hold 100,000 pounds of drag. It's something remarkable considering the parachute itself only weighs about 200 pounds. It's a very light structure. It's made from materials like you would build your camping tent out of, nylon predominantly, with a little bit of Kevlar like we build bulletproof vests out of. It comes through the back of the sled here around that small pulley. Gotcha. Uh, it goes up through this whole structure through what we call the pipe guide. Mike Meacham is the mad scientist of the group. It's his job to figure out how to design and test a parachute that won't rip apart at supersonic speeds. Parachutes that we're looking at uh, testing now are so large, no wind tunnel that exists right now can hold them. They're just not big enough. So we started looking at every possible way you could test a Mars parachute, all the way of hanging it upside down and putting potatoes inside it. We just thought of everything you could possibly do. What they came up with includes a Nighthawk military helicopter, four Mark 70 missile rocket engines, 4,000 feet of rope, and a 30-person support crew. First, the helicopter lifts the 200-pound parachute, trailing a long rope behind it. At 4,100 feet, the chopper releases the parachute, and it inflates. At the bottom of the rope is a piece of hardware called a bullet, which must drop into a large funnel at the end of a rocket-powered sled. So this structure is 50,000 pounds of steel when you add it up. Uh, it's got this enormous steel pulley. That's what's doing the real work, actually. In order to react to all that load, we had to pour two million pounds of concrete <laughs> out of the ground. Um, that was a picnic. So these concrete anchors you see around you that this structure is bolted down to, that go, they go down 18 feet into the ground. Once the bullet drops into the funnel, it triggers the rocket sled to fire. Simulating the supersonic speeds the parachute will have to endure on Mars. Uh, we like the outside rockets first, that's our first stage. And that kind of gets this big 100,000 pound sled moving. And once we get up to speed a little bit, we light the inside two rockets. Ian and Mike have run the test once before with a prototype parachute to test the mechanics. parachute didn't survive, but it didn't need to. That was just a proof of the concept for the system. 
really the only thing that went wrong during that test was a parachute failure on one of the seams. So as far as the architecture is concerned, it worked perfectly. In some ways that makes us a little nervous for this next test. You know, it's almost, it's almost going too well. You've set expectations so <laughs> high exactly already. Exactly right. <laughs> for Ian and Mike, the stakes couldn't be higher. Our ability to land humans on Mars rests on the success of this test. It's a massive and complicated operation that costs millions. One more thing, there is no plan B. They only have one parachute. Tonight, I won't be sleeping for sure. So we've got a 3 a.m. start tomorrow. I'll just be in my bed thinking about it. Extremely nervous. So many different things that have to come together. Are we gonna leave it as a cliffhanger? Yeah. <laughs> We did the full test not too long ago, the LDSD test out of Kauai, Hawaii. Hawaii. Yes, yeah. The next step, the big, what's it called, the pancake or something? They, like they that? did the flying saucer yeah. and released the, the, the Syed, which is the inflatable kind of donut to, to, to slow it down, and then the parachute. And the test itself was complete success. Yeah. Great. So no, we're amazing. really happy about that. Incredible work. I mean, the amount of effort and ingenuity that goes into testing those things, I just think that's remarkable, and that's the amazing spirit of this place. Which a lot of folks don't realize. You collaborate a lot with us, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've done well, quite a few projects with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Th through the wormhole itself, um, not man versus the universe, th through the wormhole itself was um, based on short internet films that we made here at JPL. And the uh, Science Channel and Discovery saw them and said, this should be something bigger. Mm -hmm. So it was birthed here. All yeah. right. So we have just a little bit of time for questions. Hope you're ready. And uh, I, we, we have mics out. And let's, we'll take one question. Oh, we have one question. Do you have a mic? All right. This is. Clara Ma, hi. <laughs> hi, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Clara. I'm a high school summer intern at JPL, and my question for you is if you could give. Wait, wait. <laughs> no, keep standing. Put the mic down, and let me see. I hear you. Do I hear you? Talk. Hi. <laughs> is it loud enough? It needs to be on the no. screen, though, for the feed. Yeah, oh, see, because I can't hear you through the mic. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. So just speak up. I'm here. Okay. Um, my question for you is, if you could give any piece of advice to the over 700 students who are interning at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory this summer, what would it be? Advice, advice. for 700 student interns, many of which are in here. <laughs> uh, Raise your hand if you're an intern. Quite a few. <laughs> All right. They were first in line. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no advice for you. <laughs> the advice that I would give you if you were not here was to figure out a way to get here. <laughs> Good enough? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to switch over to a Twitter question. It's from Cindy Chin. In your illustrious and long career, what is the one thing the one project that got away, what else is it that you'd love to do besides what you're doing now? Well, a lot of things got away <laughs> uh, because I didn't make the audition. I didn't pass the audition process or the interview or whatever it was. Uh, at this stage in my long and uh, illustrious career, <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know what to look forward to. I just look forward. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. We have another question in the, the audience. Right there. I have a bunch of people here. Now. Guy over there. Hello. Uh, can you hear me through the mic, or should yes. I? I think so. OK, my, my name is Hunter Rodriguez, and my question is that uh, if you were to design a mission to go anywhere in the universe, where would you go and what would you want to discover? I would go to Jupiter. I think that's the most exciting place in, 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 in our, what do you mean, in the whole universe? Whole, whole universe. Well, I don't know that much about the whole universe. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I think, I would, wouldn't I go through the uh, asteroid belt if I was on my way to yeah. Jupiter? Yeah. 
Uh, and as you know, spend a couple of orbits in the asteroid belt looking around, tagging things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I would like to proceed to one of those exciting planets, that are one of the uh, moons of, of, of Jupiter, and just watch Jupiter for a little while. What would you like to discover there? Huh? What would you like to discover there? What do I like to discover? There. <laughs> you think there's something there to discover that we haven't already done already? Uh, I have no idea. What would you say your name was? <laughs> My name is Hunter Rodriguez. Hunter. 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 Well, Hunter, I, I, I wouldn't know what to dis discover, you know. <laughs> I know there's no life, and but there are all kinds of possibilities out there in terms of ocean, uh, water, volcanic action, but what you're going to discover, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. All right, here's another social media question. In fact, there are two questions, but they're very similar. Um, if you get a one-way trip for Mars, will you go? No. <laughs> okay. Here's another one then. Okay. If offered the chance to go to space, would you accept? Yes. Why? 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 Did you see those guys? <laughs> <laughs> Have a lot of fun. Uh, I think that would probably be the adventure of a lifetime for just you know for an average person to. Uh, have a shot of, we used to send them up there, you know, t teachers and people who, I'd go. Um, yeah. All right. Um, one more question here in, right there. Howdy. Uh, my name's Carrie Bean. I'm an early career hire here at JPL. And I wanted to ask you, outside of the traditional media, how can the scientists and engineers here in the room, how can we help reach out to the general public? Oh, good question. I don't know. <laughs> You've had some thoughts on this, obviously, right? Yes, Have you? I, I run a very active Twitter account. <laughs> okay, so what do you think? Um, I think social media has really helped recently. Social um, media. A lot of us can really interact one-on-one -on -one with people that we wouldn't normally be able to reach out to. And then also, I have a whole bunch of stickers on my laptop. So if I'm traveling on a plane in an airport, people are like, oh, NASA, isn't that like shut down with the space shuttle? And I'm like, no. And then I tell them all about the cool stuff that we're doing. So this is some of the things I'm trying Thank out. Thank you but. very much. <laughs> uh, I don't know that. I, couldn't have answered that nearly as well. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this, let's try this gentleman over here, please. Him. I'm Rob Sturbo from JPL. Hang on, hang on, just a second. I'm Rob Sturbo from JPL. I wanted hi, to ask, hi. I, you, you got my wife interested in science and she's not a science person. I wanted to say for the science people, is there some way you can construct a website, references of papers of all these people you interview, because I've been trying like uh, very hard to find this fellow, Harad Tufs, uh, who uh, was a deterministic physics guy, and there's no place I saw on the internet that's got a listing of the people you interview so you can right. follow up. So that would be a great thing to, uh, to put on the website. That's a great idea. We definitely would like to do that. And um, yeah, we, we'll, uh, we'll, we should, I noticed that the, in the wormhole episodes, yeah, we don't, we just say their names and they're gone, then you have to go and hunt right, around and them. find them. So we'll certainly try and help. Thank you so people. much. Yeah. Safe, Thank you. The safe answer, Rod, is we will take that under advisement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I certainly hope you guys had fun because uh, we you. certainly just are so pleased to have this opportunity to be with you. So I'd like to thank you for taking this opportunity to be with us and on NASA TV. Um, and if there was one parting word you have, what do you think, what kind of advice do you think you can give NASA to inspire the next generation to keep exploring? Keep asking questions. There you go. All right. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, James. All right. Now, if you want a little more information about Apollo 45, I'm going to give you this little 
website, www.nasa.gov slash Apollo 45. So if you want more, it's there for you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.